Welcome to Discover Christian Church. Our mission is to love God, love people, and impact the world. This past Wednesday, Ashley Barty surprised the tennis world when she retired at age 25. I don't know if you've heard of her or not, but she was the world number one uh, female tennis player for 114 weeks, which is amazing. Only Steffi Graf and Martina Navratilova were number one for longer. But what she said um, was pretty intriguing to me. She said she was content to be done with tennis and, quote, pursue other dreams. I just thought that was interesting at 25. So today we're going to talk about the secret of contentment. How can we be content in a world that seems to be wired for us not to be content? How does that happen? Well, we're going to look at that um, idea in the book of Philippians chapter 4. This is our final week in Philippians, uh, so I hope you've had a chance to dig into it and, and see how God is speaking to you. Just a real quick summary of where we've been. The first week we talked about how um, it was important to have these authentic relationships, that that Paul was so close to the Philippian people, and he said uh, he just loved them greatly and had a wonderful, wonderful, intimate relationship with them. So we challenged ourselves to find somebody that we would pray for for the month of February and have someone who prayed for us. And I hope you were able to do that. And if not, you can do that today. The second way we talked about how Paul was like, he loved being with the people. He loved being with Jesus. But he said, you know what? There's something even better. Like when I get to die, it's even a gain, right? So this life is wonderful, but heaven is going to be even better. And the third week, we talked about how we need to be obedient to Jesus in various areas of our lives. And when we are obedient, that aligns us really well with God. It aligns us with the people around us. And it actually makes it possible for the kingdom of heaven to come into our lives and then to be shown to the people around us. And we kind of continued that idea in the fourth week when we talked about how we need to be caring servants, as Paul was, as Jesus was, and that we need to make a positive difference in the world. In the fifth week, we talked about how, again, this world is great, but nothing, nothing compares to Jesus. And we talked about a word that Paul used when he said, you know, this stuff is great, but I consider it rubbish. Or he literally said, I consider this to be dung, right? This is poo compared to to knowing Jesus. And and that was really kind of impactful. Um, We also talked about how We don't need to allow anything in our past to hold us back. Whether that's a challenge, whether that's a victory, uh, the enemy is going to try to get us to stay in the past, and God wants to go forward, and so we want to press on with Jesus. Last week, we talked about how we should be realistic optimists, if you will, that our minds should be focused on things that are good, Right? Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things, right? Our memory verse for this month. That's what we want to do. We want to focus on those things. And then today, as we wrap up this letter, we're going to talk about the secret of being content. And we're going to jump right in. We're in Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 10, and we're using the Christian Standard Bible today. Paul says, he's wrapping it up. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned for me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with little and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or need. I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. And you Philippians know that in my early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my, for my needs several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. 
but I have received everything in full, and I have had abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send you greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to the Caesar's household. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So that's how Paul ends up his letter. Let's make just a few general comments before we dig into this specific idea of contentment. Overall, he, he says, thank you. He, he has said it many times in the letter. Thank you for your partnership from the very beginning in the ministry. Thank you for the impact that you have made by serving, by being generous, by being involved in the good news of the kingdom and the difference that it's made in the lives of people around you. And, and this past month, um, this past week, actually, the Christian Children's Home of Ohio um, honored Discover Christian Church. It says, Heart for the Home Award 2022, Discover Christian Church. And we don't say that to be like, woo, look at Discover. We say that to say, look at the ministry that God is doing at the Christian Children's Home of Ohio and how we have, since the beginning of the Christian Children's Home of Ohio, been a partner, like the Philippians were partners in the ministry with Paul, and how lives have been changed, how eternities have been changed because of this partnership in the gospel. And we have many uh, ministry partners, global outreach partners, that we are so grateful to be connected with. In fact, next Sunday, we're going to have some of them here with us. They'll be in the lobby. We will also um, encourage them to come in and we'll pray for them during the worship service. But they will be in the lobby after the worship hour for you to give, an opportunity, to give you an opportunity to connect with them, to ask them about their ministry. To, to ask what God is doing, to, to pray with them, to encourage them, and to say, how can I get engaged in this ministry and what God is doing and making a difference? We want all of our partners to feel the same kind of connection and love that we sense with the Christian Children's Home of Ohio. That is just the way we want things to be, just like it was in the New Testament. So there's that idea, this, this partnership is really important. There's also this idea of generosity that comes through. And, and Paul says, you know, when you live generously, when you give generously, then God says, wow, what a fragrant offering that is. What a difference that makes. And God, just, he just like kind of takes it in and says, that is a pleasing scent to me to see people giving sacrificially, giving and living in a way that makes a difference in the lives of others. Paul also says when you live and you give sacrificially and generously, guess what? God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He doesn't need our money, but what he does want is a heart to surrender to him. And when we surrender, God says, you know what? I'm just going to continue to bless you because you've been faithful with a little. Be faithful with more. God is generous as he sees our generosity. And, and understand that, that that phrase is really important. God will supply all our What's the word? All of our needs. Not necessarily all of our wants, right? <laughs> There's a difference between those two. And probably, you know, we all struggle with what is need and what is want. But God will provide. And he'll do that for individuals. He'll do that for, for families. He will do that for churches as they live in the same way that Jesus lived. I also think it's fascinating that Paul very specifically mentions the household of Caesar that there are people in, in like the, the emperor and the king's house that, you know, they had to say Caesar is God, and yet they're saying, no, Jehovah, God is God. And we, we seem to think, you know, well, these people are too far gone or they're doing stuff that, you know, won't allow them to ever accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, but we should never put that limitation on anyone. We should never put that limitation on God. Because God has every opportunity and gives every opportunity to people to accept Jesus. So we need to just continue to share the good news. And I love how he also says, you know, I, I just greet you all warmly. And, and I want you to be blessed with the grace of Jesus. And that's how we should be with each other. Just pour grace and love and mercy over each other. 
Well, the last uh, part of our message, that was the first part, and that was the short part, just so you know. Anyway, the rest of the time we're going to be in um, verses 11 through 13. And I just want us to ask, you know, what, what God are you going to say to me in these three verses? I mean, it's only three verses. Surely there's not a lot in there. Or is it possible that God will say something significant to you? Is it possible even that there is, there is information and inspiration in how we might learn to be more content? So before we read those verses one more time, um, let's pray. God, we do ask um, in, in the challenging um, nature of life that you would speak to us through your word and through your spirit and help us, help me to be more content. In the name of Jesus, amen. You know, contentment is like a battle, right? It's a struggle. And you know what? It's not original to you. <laughs> it happened with Adam and Eve, like the very first people on the planet. If you think about it, they were living in a perfect situation, right? They had no needs. Everything was provided. They, they just had this beauty and this harmony with each other and with God and with all of creation, and yet the enemy came in and said, hey, let me talk to you for a second. Do you think that God is withholding something from you? You think he might like not want something for you that you really would love to have? Do you really think this is enough? Or would you rather, and they say, you know, I think you may be right. And their discontented choice broke the world and still has implications and things, consequences that are happening in our lives today. But before you go, oh, good job, Adam and Eve, all of us have made discontented choices that affect not only us, but the people around us just like they did. So when we think of it, well, is there any hope then? If we all struggle with this, well, yeah, there is hope. And we just read about it, but let's read one more time, verses 11 through 13. Paul says this, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. Whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. So I think there are some secrets there, if you will, that will help us as we try to get a better grasp on being content. So the first one is this, contentment is learned. He says it in there more than once. I have learned. I have learned. Paul knew abundance. Like when he was in Philippi, um, Lydia was one of the people that helped start the church there, and she was wealthy. So you know that when they were getting together, like they were having good food. You know what I mean? <laughs> they were like doing the big thing because she had the money to be able to do that. Paul had said, he said, I've had all kinds of stuff. I know what it's like to live in abundance. But he also knew hardship, like stuff we would never have faced. When he's writing to the Corinthian church, he says this, I've been hungry uh, I've been hungry. I've been thirsty, probably. I've had clothes that are just completely worn out. Eh, probably not so much. I've been roughly treated, homeless, beaten, imprisoned. I've spent many sleepless nights. I've been shipwrecked three times. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I mean, this guy had like, Total extremes, right? Tons of stuff, tons of nothing. But whether he had a little or a lot, Paul said, I have learned to be content. And contentment is learned. You aren't born with it. Instead, we seem to be born with a bit of selfishness, don't we? The words mine and more are not typically associated with maturity. We aren't born with contentment, but we do have an opportunity, many opportunities, to learn contentment. 
But the question is, do we? Do we learn contentment or do we just let it pass us by? Here are just a few examples. You can think of others. You know, when I got my phone, it was amazing. But man, it's already two years old. It's two years old. Can you believe it? And have you seen the new model and the new colors? Woo! It's so amazing. Or, man, I had a 42-inch TV, which was awesome. Until I saw a 55-inch TV, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So I bought the 55-inch TV. Have you seen that new 80-inch TVs? Those are amazing. I'm getting me an 80-inch TV so I can be happy. How long does the new car really make you content? or the new place to live, or the new golf clubs. I had somebody after the first hour say, I'm not getting new golf clubs. And I said, well, I figured out it wasn't my golf clubs. Anyway, that wasn't the problem. The new clothes, the new relationship. Oh, it's just, now I'm going to be content once I get, once, once. Contentment can be learned. As we journey through this life, and we will have opportunities to learn, but we need to be sure that we do that. And part one, this idea of learning is closely related to everything that comes after it. And part of that is this next thing. It's not about our stuff. And we kind of touched on that, right? We don't have contentment because of the stuff. Now, it's pretty hard, maybe like almost impossible to be content if you or maybe even more someone that you love does not have the basic necessities, right? Like if you don't have the basic needs being met, it's hard to be content. But that's not the problem. Paul already said God will supply your needs. On the opposite side of this is having so much that it actually becomes a distraction. And there, in between those extremes is really kind of where we want to be. And again, it's a continuum and it's a spectrum and people live in different ways and we shouldn't judge anyone. We should just have our relationship with God. But I love what it says in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. It gives us this balanced perspective. It says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much. And disown you and say, who's God? I don't need God. I've got everything I need. Or I may become poor and then steal and dishonor the name of my God. Don't give me poverty. Don't give me riches. Give me my daily bread, which is what Jesus prayed for. You see, the more possessions you have, the more potential they have to possess you and me. A rich business owner was walking along the shore, and she saw a, a man who had a fishing boat, but he wasn't fishing. And she said, hey, why aren't you fishing? He said, oh, I already fished today. I caught all the fish I need. And she said, well, okay, but listen, listen. You caught all you need, but what if you caught more than you need? Because then you could sell those fish and you could have more money. And you could do that for a while and then you could buy a bigger boat. And then you know, after you buy a bigger boat, it's going to have bigger nets, bigger capacity. You're going to be able to get more fish. And then if you keep doing that for a while, you'll be able to get more boats and you can hire employees and you can have a fleet. And then you keep doing that for a while and you're going to be rich like me. And he said, okay, then what would I do? And she said, well, then, listen, you could take it easy and relax and enjoy life. And as he sat with his drink looking out at the sea, he said, what do you think I'm doing right now? 
There was a uh, book that came out in 1995. If you can see this picture here, it's called Material World by Peter Menzel. And uh, this isn't to produce guilt, trust me, but it does kind of make you go, whoa. Um, he, his goal was to go throughout the world and have people empty everything out of their homes and put it out um, outside, and then they would take a picture of it. And you can see on the top row, there are three homes of, you know, probably not as much stuff as you have. This is one of the two pictures on the bottom of people in the United States. A slight difference. Again, the idea is not to go, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I need to feel guilty and shame about that. No, but it's just to remind us, here's what Jesus said. Listen, your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. That is not your life. But we are told through thousands of advertisements and comparisons that we make every day, oh, I just need that one more thing. But it's not based on stuff. I've been blessed to be uh, on mission trips to about 10 different countries. Um, we've lived in a couple of foreign nations. And um, honestly, I feel like that's a pretty limited experience to be able to make this statement, but I think this is true. Contentment and joy are based on something much more significant than stuff. And whether we have a little or a lot, we can be satisfied. The difference, I would say, in, in the person that feels this authentic contentment and the person who doesn't is not dependent on the stuff. It's dependent on what's inside. In other words, it's what Paul gives as probably the most important part of this secret. He says, it's only possible through Jesus. I can find contentment I can learn contentment, no matter what my circumstances are, through Jesus, who gives me the strength. Now, you guys have heard Philippians 4.13 a lot. If you've been involved in the church at all, it's like the verse, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we have this thing we, we talk about, you know, be careful not to take a verse out of context, because you can take that and go, right, and take it right out and go, oh, yeah, I can do anything. Which basically means, if you take that verse out of context, it means, I can read your mind through Christ who strengthens me. I can. It says I can do anything. I can do all things. I can fly. I can jump off the top of this building and fly and land on the ground because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can go like this, and when I open my hands, there are going to be a thousand, thousand dollar bills in there because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Probably not. Context is really, really, really important. Now, I'm not saying God won't do all kinds of cool things through you outside of what the context of this verse is saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when you take this verse, you have to take it in the surrounding verses where Paul is talking about contentment. He's talking about being satisfied no matter what's going on around him because of Jesus. I will be content in any circumstance because I have God living in me. Paul has learned it's not the stuff around him, but Jesus in him that brings contentment. We need to learn. I'm talking to myself. We need to learn that God is enough. But that only happens when we continuously develop a deeper relationship with God. Teresa and I, we can be content and we can enjoy a, a walk in the city park as much as we can enjoy a walk in an expensive place that we've paid for a vacation rental. I'll also tell you that if we're fighting, we can be on a beautiful mountain area or on a beach, and it's not that joyful. And by the way, when we're fighting, it's my fault. That's, that's reality. But the health of our relationship is way more important than the surroundings. Now, of course, we do enjoy going to the beach and we enjoy going to the mountains, so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. What I'm saying is the relationship is more important than the environment, and we need to keep that in mind. 
That's why Paul can say, my relationship with God is strong, and so it doesn't really matter what my environment is in comparison. Well, so far we've seen that we can learn contentment, that it's not really based on what we have, but it's based on a relationship with Jesus. And I think Philippians 4 says one more thing uh, that we need to understand about contentment. It's this. It's up to us as well. Like we play a part in whether we're content or not. Now, it's not as obvious because a little bit is lost in the translation from the original Greek wording, but it is important for us to understand. So let's do a quick, a quick Greek word study. By the way, I studied ancient Greek in 1985 and 86, um, but here's the deal. So it's been a minute, right? But here's the deal. Ancient Greek hasn't changed between 1985 and now, so it still seems valid to me. Anyway, the Greek word um, archaeo is a verb, and it means to suffice or to be enough or to be contented or to be satisfied. All right, so that's the primary verb here. And then there's this word auto or auto, which means it's, it goes, it's a prefix that goes before a word, and what it means is that then says that it's based on the worth or the responsibility of the thing that it's connected to or that it precedes. So it's like a responsibility. It's only going to happen if it happens by the person, by the thing that it is connected to. So it's like a reflexive thing. It makes it go back to the responsibility or the the, uh, um, activity of the person. So here's what happens when you put auto in front of the word archeo, the verb, and you make a noun. It's only used a few times in the Bible, but what it, what it talks about is the sufficiency, the contentment is based reflexively. It's on you. And that's the word that's used here. So it's only used, this word is only used a few times in the Bible. <clears throat> and in each instance, it's very intentional. So here, I'm going to read for you the, the instances where it's used in the New Testament. First Timothy 6.6, 6. godliness with contentment Autarkes is that word, is great gain, great gain. Godliness with contentment, autarkes, is great gain. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency, autarkes, in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied, autarkes, With what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Philippians 4.12. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, altarkes, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. Again, this month's memory verse is about making a decision. I'm going to focus, I'm going to choose to focus on good things, on godly things. And as I make that decision, wow, look how little these things have to do with stuff. They just don't have a lot to do with our material possessions. And just like we get to choose to focus on good things, on godly things, we get to choose whether we're going to be content or not. You can say, you know, what I have is enough or I just will never be satisfied. I'm always going to find something that's not okay. Have we learned, have we chosen to be content in Jesus? Now, obviously, we all have our moments. No one is perfect, but we need to keep this in mind. Whenever we are bitter, whenever we complain, whenever we always find that one thing that just doesn't seem to be quite right, or whenever we express discontent, like when we do that on a consistent basis, like basically what we're saying to God, just like Adam and Eve did, is you kind of messed up here. You didn't give me everything I needed. You just didn't quite get it exactly right. And I want you to know that. And you know that not only affects your relationship with God, It affects your relationship with people around you. When I do that, it affects my relationship with God and the people around me. 
And if it's perpetual, it's actually going to drive people away from us. Like, how many of us love to be around the person who just is never satisfied? Isn't that awesome? It's so fun. But here's what's worse. If we're followers of Jesus and we are not content, if we continuously live in a state of discontent, not only does that sort of drive people away from us, they look at our lives and they say, oh, that's what happens when you follow Jesus. I don't think I'm interested. There's a word called repentance that is kind of a, it fits into a language that we call Christianese. Like you don't hear repentance really used a lot outside of people in the church and people of faith talking about stuff. But it is an important word. The Bible uses it and, and it's easy to define. Repentance is you were going that way and you turn around. It's literally a U-turn. It's a 180. That's all repentance is. It's, it's saying I need to be changed. I need to turn around. And church, if, if we are living in a state of perpetual dissatisfaction and we are not content and we're always looking for the next thing and we are not satisfied in Jesus, then we need to turn around. We need to repent. We just do. We need to ask God to help us learn to be content in Jesus. A man named Jason Lehman wrote this poem. He writes, It was spring, but it was summer I wanted. Yeah, I know today this is very applicable, right? Anyway, it was spring, but it was summer I wanted. The warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted. The colorful leaves and the cool dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was now winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age that I wanted. The presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, but I never got what I wanted. Jason Lehman wrote that poem when he was 14 years old. I think he got it. You know, contentment doesn't come from doing. It doesn't come from having. Contentment doesn't come from those things. It doesn't come from anything external. In fact, contentment comes from realizing who you are and even more importantly, whose you are. We will not be content until we are content in Jesus. One more time, Philippians 4.13, this time in the message paraphrase. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. We're getting ready to sing these words to God. You're always enough, forever enough, more than enough. 